Hello and welcome to the series on cyanobacteria. Over the next few episodes, we'll be looking at what cyanobacteria is, why we should care about it, how we might detect it, and any mitigations that we need to consider. I have the pleasure of being joined by an absolute expert panel today. From the Lutra team, we have Brett Clapham and Jonathan Church, both either principal or senior process engineers and specialising in water treatment here at Lutra. From the Cawthron team, I have the joy of welcoming Jonathan Puddock and Catherine Moisan, who will be talking from a more scientific um, aspect around cyanobacteria. So let's kick into it. First of all, what is cyanobacteria? Jonathan, maybe I'll get you to start. Uh, so cyanobacteria, you can kind of think of them as little floating plants, which are sometimes in our waterways around New Zealand and around the world. So like plants, they harvest light from the sun and use that as the energy source. And so that means that they can live in really sort of simple lifestyle. So you can mm -hmm. find them all over the place and actually sort of rivers and lakes aren't the only places you'll find them. Mm. But from a drinking water perspective, um, you know, that's where we get our water from. So, yeah. They're one of the most, the oldest organisms on earth, right? Yeah, yeah. So billions of years they've been around for and they sort of were the first organisms that we had on the planet. So, mm. um, you know, they basically put the oxygen into the atmosphere for all of us to be able to breathe. So they evolved long before anything else was around. Yeah, it's a very hardy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And also means that they've thought of lots of clever ways to be able to exist in places where we wouldn't expect them to. Mm. And that's when we sometimes see problems is because cyanobacteria, they're able to do clever things like sort of live in places where they don't have the nutrients. Mm. Um, that other ones might be able to need to be able to grow. Um, they can also use sort of quite random nutrient sources. So mm -hmm. in a river, which we might think is clean, they can take sediment and actually extract the nitrogen and phosphate okay. from that as a yeah. source to be able to grow. So, you know, sort of, you can't exactly predict mm. where they might pop up. So I have to say, I mean, they, they sound quite harmless and Producing oxygen is always a good thing. <laughs> so I guess why, why should I care about cyanobacteria? Yeah, yeah, so lots of cyanobacteria are good and you know, they're a completely natural part of freshwater ecosystems. Mm. Um, but some cyanobacteria are able to produce compounds which are harmful to humans and animals. So mm -hmm. we call these toxins. And so it's not every type of cyanobacteria, um, but when you do have cyanobacteria present in a waterway, it does indicate to you that other types of cyanobacteria which might be able to produce toxins mm -hmm. could also grow in that environment. So that's why we sort of have this blinkers on mm. um, to look out when we start to see cyanobacteria in a waterway um, because it may mean that there could be toxin producing cyanobacteria and you could have toxins present. Yes, yes. Mm. So okay. you mentioned that they need uh, light from the sun and also in in surface water sources. So does that mean wells and bore sources are safe from these uh, organisms? Yeah, so if you don't have light present, you won't have sort of a large growth of cyanobacteria. And often people are used to cyanobacteria in a sort of lake or river setting where they get these sort of big masses starting to form. Now we call these blooms. Um, so when you don't have much light, you're not gonna have a large amount of growth Mm. In a well or bore setting, what you need to be worried about there is if you have a connected water source, which is quite close, are the toxins from that water supply, where you've got lots of cyanobacteria growing, potentially, actually infiltrating and getting into that um, sort of safe water source, the, mm. the bore mm. or the groundwater. So that's what we need to be um, sort of careful and mindful about, is this connectivity between different water bodies. Yeah. And they also produce a taste and odour compounds, right? The yeah, and that can be really handy. Mm. These sort of um, musty mm. sort of tastes and aromas, they're sort of like mm. an early warning sign that you might have cyanobacteria Something present. Really, yeah, yeah. yeah. The way, way I've had it described to me is the sort of smell you get after rain, you know, yes. sort of musty, dirty. 
Yeah, sort of leafy. You imagine you're walking through mm. a bush and you're stirring up the leaves. Mm. That's sort of that pleasant aroma for a cyanobacteria yes. scientist. I, I was, <laughs> was going to say, yeah, in a, in a winery type term, I think they call those earthy undertones. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> if your water has earthy undertones, then potentially there is uh, something present. Yeah, so that's good for the people from Wellington. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> They'll be able to understand that. So, so, I mean, putting that into, I guess, simpler terms. So, do we consider cyanobacteria, I mean, just to um, everyday people, is that algae? Yeah, yeah. So quite often when we're talking about cyanobacteria to the public, we'll call it toxic algae. Yes. Um, because otherwise there's sort of a lot of confusion. It's bacteria, but it's not bacteria like E. coli. Um, it's acting like algae in plants. So mm. yeah, we mm. quite often do refer to it as toxic algae. Yes. And in fact, yeah. it's often called blue-green algae as well. So okay. The reason for that is that they have a pigment that when they are in very high numbers, you can actually see them in the water. Mm. The bloom will look bluish or vivid green. So yeah, that's mm. okay. where the common name comes from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So I guess this brings me on to the sort of toxins you mentioned before. So I believe these are called cyanotoxins. So I guess when and how are these produced? Yeah, so cyanotoxins, they will be present if you have a cyanobacteria which is able to produce these toxins. So mm -hmm. um, they have genes or sort of DNA code which allow them to build up these toxic compounds. And so some cyanobacteria will have those genes and they're able mm. to go through and actually produce this compound. And the compound isn't produced necessarily to sort of um, harm us or animals. Mm. It's probably for some other purpose that they produce it, which has been beneficial for them. Yes. Um, so one great way to be able to figure out whether you have toxic cyanobacteria is if we go in and we look for those genes mm. responsible for the toxin production. Yes. And it's really difficult just by actually looking at a cyanobacteria to know whether it's producing toxins yes. or not. Mm. So we can't sort of look down a microscope and know for sure, mm. is this a toxin producing cyanobacteria or not? But Catherine's lab, um, what they can do is to look under the microscope and mm -hmm. identify what type of cyanobacteria is present in a waterway. Um, and so what that tells us is, has this be species of cyanobacteria been known to produce mm. toxins in the past? And yes. So that's sort of a pretty good first gate um, to tell you sort of, do you have a potential threat mm. there mm. that you should be looking into a little bit deeper? Yes. Or, you know, actually, is the risk level quite low because no one's ever seen toxins produced mm, in that mm. type of cyanobacteria before. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, the, that's the speciation test, right? Yes, that you know all right. the different species that are present. What you're saying is that that's right. yeah, often the species can be there, but they, they don't produce anything. You know, mm. So really I see that as a three-tiered approach, if you like. You can look at the water sample and see which species are there, whether they potentially produce toxins. But because we can't see that, you know, we can't see from the um, morphology of the algae whether it produces or not, then we can move on to that gene test. Mm. Right. And mm. that will tell us whether the strain of algae has got the potential, is able to produce toxins or not. Mm. And then if that gene test tells us, yes, there's a risk, there, then we can move on to the actual toxin testing to determine whether it in fact produces it. Mm. Right. Okay. So in terms of these genes, um, how, how does it work? Do the, do the cyanobacteria just decide to turn them on? Is there anything that sort of triggers those genes to go from you know, a passive presence to an active one? Well, that's a good question. So the, a, a, a cyanobacteria that has the gene won't necessarily produce toxins. There are environmental mm. triggers mm. that will get it to switch it on or off. Mm. So again, it's not because it's got the gene that it will necessarily produce the toxins. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it might be back to what you were saying about the, um, you know, the different energy sources and their ability to adapt and turn the genes on and off to, to cope with their environment and sometimes they produce the toxins at the same time. Yeah. Are, are there certain environmental conditions you'd say that's kind of the worst time when you would expect cyanotoxins or? Jake might be able to come in right. on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really have good knowledge on the triggers for cyanotoxin um, production. 
So, um, you know, sort of that's where we need to start getting into cyanotoxin testing. Like it'd be really nice if we could chuck together a model which says mm. at this temperature, mm. at this light intensity and with these nutrients, we're expecting to have this level of cyanotoxins present. Um, but it's just sort of not the case. We're not quite there mm. Um, mm. yet. So, you know, that's why we need to sort of, if we've got cyanobacteria present, they have the capability to produce toxins because they've got those genes. Mm. That's when we start doing cyanotoxin testing because we don't know if it's sort of this much cyanotoxin there or whether it's sort of lots that we've mm. actually got present. Mm. So what we can say is if there's more cyanobacteria present in a waterway, then there's likely to be more cyanotoxins present. Just, yep. Yep. you know, you've got more factories out yeah, there yeah, 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 yeah. producing yep. this stuff. So essentially they can also live in a passive state as well. So just because you have, I guess, um, cyanobacteria or algae in your water source, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're producing toxins. They can also sit in more of a passive state. Would that be correct? Yeah, so they quite often sort of be there just um, sort of chugging along. They'll have a low le level of toxins mm. present. And then there are scenarios where you might get up regulations um, in toxin production. Mm. And, you know, it's also quite natural for any freshwater environment to have a low level of cyanobacteria mm. present. Mm -hmm. They're a natural part of that ecosystem. And, you know, other things are feeding yeah, um, yep, on them. Yep. So, you know, you shouldn't be sort of terrified if mm. there's cyanobacteria there or oh, something's wrong yes. with my freshwater environment because there's cyanobacteria. Mm. It's when sort of the levels start going up. Going up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess bringing this back into, I guess, context of drinking water and I guess drinking water treatments, and this is probably more at the Lutra team, how do cyanobacteria or cyanotoxins affect water treatment? Yeah, well, the, the, probably the first, the first thing is the taste and odour. That'll be easily the most common problem that happens in New Zealand. Hmm. Um, it, uh, essentially, the cyanobacteria release a, a, a very low level of um, compounds like geosmin and 2-MIB, which um, impart a, I guess, a musty, earthy kind of taste to the water, and people can pick this up because even though the concentrations are minute, um, the human, you know, sensory... Um, organs are quite quite capable of smelling and tasting it very easily. So um, mm. yeah, so when your water tastes like dirt, that can often be the um, the reason why. So okay. yeah, that, that's a that's a palatability issue. Um, they also obviously, as we've talked about, have the ability to release the actual toxins themselves. Mm. And there's a myriad of different types of toxins, and all of them have very very low levels at which they can be harmful to humans. Um, in sort of the microgram, nanogram level. So, um, mm. so that in itself is obviously a much more serious issue because bad taste of water, yes, that, that's, a, that's a concern, but really the toxins are the things that can... Um, that's where the can, real risk can lies. Kill you. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's also encouraging because MIB and geosmin can be detected at very low levels by the pellets, but um, those levels aren't, aren't harmful. They're quite, they're quite a bit higher mm. harmful mm. for those two uh, molecules, but... Um, as Jonathan's saying, is that's where uh, you must be, yeah, aware that there could be other cyanotoxins um, in the source water. Hmm. Um, and then also the, the, the drinking water standards, they have these levels of concentrations that are acceptable hmm. um, and beyond which it, they become harmful based on the World Health, Health Organization levels. And also with the updates to the drinking water standards um, coming in July 2022, there's going to be a greater onus put on water supplies to be aware hmm. of what's in their source water and the potential risk of cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins. Yes, excellent. And I, I guess there's also, there's also the practical aspect of water treatment um, and what cyanobacteria can actually do to the water treatment plant. And that's um, often an undesirable side effect. So even if you don't have a taste and odor problem or a cyanotoxin problem, um, algae itself can cause nasty things to happen in mm. your, in your mm. processes. Um, what one one or two examples is because they can be buoyant, um, they're difficult to settle out. So if you have a process which needs to settle the, the algae or settle the solids, um, the algae tend not to, so therefore they kind of float up and go out mm. onto your filters or your membranes or whatever you have downstream. And also because <laughs> they can they can have funny um, aspects like being 
quite filamentous, I understand, yeah. which uh, acts sort of like a, almost like a polymer in terms of water treatment and mm. causes filters to become blinded. Um, yep. You know, so yeah, so the presence can affect your production of water um, and the efficiency of your treatment plant, and not just the, mm. Um, mm. not just, you know, the, the taste and odor of cyanotoxins. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Is there any clever ways to get around it? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of, in terms of the floating issue, a, a dissolved air flotation process works absolutely fantastically on those kind of um, algal species because it, it essentially accelerates the floating and then you yeah. scrape them off and, <laughs> hmm. and that's quite good. Um, in terms of settling, um, there's also ways to settle things faster like using sand ballasted active flow type systems hmm. which basically add a very dense micro sand which kind of gets caught up with the algae. Um, and makes it settle like a stone. So, yeah. you know, these yeah. kind of processes can remove them. Um, but yeah, it's just about, I wouldn't say they're that common. And, um, and you know, it's probably more the case that plants that don't have the right treatment are the ones that are going to get the blooms for them. Excellent. Well, I think that's probably enough for the introduction to cyanobacteria. So when we come back in our next episode, we'll look at how we go about detecting these um, and then followed by how we might mitigate some of the risks behind cyanobacteria. 